And they pride theirself, themselves on being a place that, unlike other corporate media outlets, lets their hosts and their guests say things that are outside of the, con the na very narrow confines of acceptable speech. Um, and what we know now is that that's just a, mo a model to make money. There's no actual commitment to free speech or an actual commitment to uh, media that uh, that exists outside of the narrow uh, limits of what's acceptable speech. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Many people have been censored or even fired over the years for criticizing Israel or supporting Palestinian liberation in the U.S. mainstream. Mark Lamont Hill was sacked from CNN for saying Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. Stephen Salaita lost his job at the University of Illinois for criticizing the Israeli atrocities against Palestinians in Gaza in 2014. We've come to expect this sort of thing from mainstream institutions. But what about those that pride themselves on their refusal to censor or submit to cancel culture? That was the whole shtick at The Hills Rising, a popular online show that bills itself as a populist platform for both left and right views to debate, no matter how extreme. Yet it was this anti-cancel culture outlet that recently canceled Katie Halper for a solid and well-sourced critique of Israeli apartheid. To discuss what happened behind the scenes, the role of independent media, specifically breakthrough news and pushing back, and its aftermath, I'm joined by the woman at the center of the saga, Katie Halper. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Katie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you back on. In fact, you were like one of the first people I think I had on Dispatches when it started a little over a year ago. So this what is very an exciting. honor. Like a reunion. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously, I am having you on to talk about all of the crazy drama that's transpired over the last month for you, which Breakthrough was somewhat involved with. And I know you've probably retold the story so many times because you've been all over the place talking about it. But it's worth getting into it again. Can you lay out for our audience what happened with The Hill and how did you get fired? Sure. So what happened with The Hill is that I had been uh, appearing on The Hill basically every week as a guest, um, as a you know contributor uh, for like three years because I started when uh, Crystal Ball and Sagar were at, the, at Rising at The Hill. And then I uh, took off when they left, there was like a little hiatus, and then they invited me back uh, in the new iteration of Rising, which has rotating hosts. Um, I mean, a solid stable of hosts, but it's not just uh, two hosts. It's different hosts. And the shtick with, with Rising is that it has a host from the left and a host from the right. Mm -hmm. So I basically, over the course of three years, I would appear on the show every week. And uh, then I started getting some uh, hosting gigs. And so I had hosted uh, four times already, and I was going to host at least two more times. That those were already booked by the time I hosted this this uh, this pivot this uh, exciting time that I hosted, uh, where all the drama happened, which we'll get into. Yeah. Um, and I was going to be doing more hosting. And when you're a host, you do these things called radars, which are basically monologues delivered straight to the camera. And um, I had not done one of those yet because I wanted to make sure like I had mastered hosting because you know it's like a, a lot to host you do a lot of segments so I wanted to make sure that I you know was was hosting well and I did host well if I do say so myself uh the audience actually really really liked my hosting uh the comments were positive which as you know is incredibly rare uh mm -hmm. it's usually just negative comments that you get um I also had pitched them a pilot that we actually shot i pitched them a pilot which is basically like a left-wing version of the view uh i did it with uh in studio at their studio in dc with brianna joy gray there live and then we had on you and abby and it was yeah, a it was really, really fun. fun panel show uh and they released one of the segments that we did uh and it did great on youtube so uh i decided this was my fourth time hosting i was going to do a radar one of these monologues and i wanted to do it on what had happened with Rashida Tlaib 
who had been smeared basically for fairly innocuous, I mean, I would say totally defensible, obviously, comments that she made. She delivered virtual remarks to a Justice for Palestine conference, and she said mm -hmm. that it's getting clearer and clearer that you can't be progressive except for on Palestine, and that you can't be progressive while supporting Israel's apartheid government. So she was slammed over those comments by members of Congress. Jonathan Greenblatt from the Anti-Defamation League obviously smeared her. And not only that, but he just totally misrepresented what she said. Not only did he say it was anti-Semitic, but she, he said that she'd imposed a litmus test on American Jews. Just not true at all. She didn't mention American Jews. Um, but this guy is, you know, pretty consistently dishonest. Um, Jake Tapper did a segment on it where he did some of her Jewish colleagues are calling her comments anti-Semitic. And so I decided what I would do is I would do a monologue laying out, first of all, like defending her, but also laying out why Israel is indeed an apartheid state. And to do that, I cited and quoted in the International Criminal Court. I cited and quoted the United Nations because apartheid is actually a defined crime. It's an, according to international law. It's obviously the system that existed in South Africa, but it also applies to other countries. They turned into a crime. They started in the 70s. They did that. Um, so then I quoted and cited Israeli law that obviously falls under that category or fits that definition. I, I cited human rights organizations, uh, Palestinian human rights organizations, international ones like uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Then I cited and quoted Beth Selim, an Israeli human rights organization, I cited and quoted uh, Israeli officials, including prime ministers, who either warned that apartheid was going to, to happen or said apartheid was happening. Uh, then I cited and quoted Nelson Mandela and uh, Desmond Tutu and Naledi Pandor, who is a current uh, minister of foreign affairs for South Africa, who had just spoken at the United Nations General Assembly and um, argued uh, that you know, actually, she ironically said that the consensus, there was growing weight, you know, growing consensus about around the fact that Israel was an apartheid state. And interestingly enough, she cited Daniel Levy, who was an Israeli negotiator at Oslo. So the idea that, you know, it's controversial to say this is a bit ridiculous. I mean, it's controversial to say this in corporate media, but mm -hmm. the human rights community has basically just, there's consensus that it's apartheid. And so I recorded that. I did the hosting, my other hosting duties. You know, you do a bunch of segments. I left. And as I was leaving, a producer called me and said she wanted me to hear from her that higher ups had seen the radar, the monologue, and they didn't want to release it. And I was like, why? And she said, well, I didn't know this. Had I known this, I would have told you ahead of time that uh, there's a policy. The Hill doesn't run op-eds on Israel, either video <laughs> or written op-eds. And I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. And then we spent a couple of days going back and forth. I was trying to get them to run the radar. I was, you know, open to, but she specified, I should add, that you could do segments on it, just not op-eds. And just to clarify the segment, when I'm on as a guest, that counts as a segment. I obviously, I have a position when I'm on as a guest. That's why they have me on. But it's not the like, op-ed it's not a, a straight to camera right monologue right it's like a back and forth discussion so i'm going back and forth with them uh this happened on monday that i shot the monologue then by wednesday i get a call from the uh editor-in-chief bob cusack he called of the hill he's the editor-in-chief of the hill he calls me and he tells me they're not going to run the radar the monologue i said why he says well we get lots of pitches that we pass on which is not a sincere explanation because I know this from having friends who are hosts at the Hill. Uh, Robbie, uh, excuse me, uh, Ryan Grimm, who's who was a host at the Hill uh, and wrote about this, said that he estimated he did about 150 of these uh, monologues and never got any editorial guidance. You know, it's not a pitching process. You literally email the team, they load it into the teleprompter, and that's it. So I knew that wasn't true. Then he also said that it didn't fit into their sweet spot, the Hill sweet spot of coverage, which was domestic. Okay. One. Sweet spot. That sweet, sweet spot, spot. That coverage sweet spot. So one, <laughs> Rashida Tlaib is a U.S. congresswoman last time I checked. So it's a domestic story in large part. But also, that's just not true. And I know this from hosting. Uh, I hosted. That was my fourth time hosting. I know, We did several international stories. And I've been a guest hundreds of times. 
literally yeah. hundreds of times. So I know international stories are totally appropriate for, for rising. They do them all the time. So I knew that wasn't true. So at this point, I texted the producers and I was like, okay, so obviously they're not running the radar, uh, the monologue. Can I talk about it tomorrow for my segment? And I wasn't trying to be cutesy. It wasn't a gotcha. This was the information I'd been given was that Israel is basically out of bounds for op-eds, not out of bounds for segments. And this, uh, I, I tape my segments uh, Thursday mornings. And so I, I texted them that and the producers like, check your email. You should have gotten an email. And uh, I checked my email and a, a woman who's a, another higher up at the Hill wrote, dear, hi, uh, hi, Katie, we're not, you won't, we don't need you to come in tomorrow for your segment. Feel free to send any unpaid invoices. We wish you best of luck. That was it. That was Wednesday evening. The good news is uh, I reached out to you guys at Breakthrough News and Thursday morning we recorded it and the video did really well. And, um, you know, it's gotten hundreds of thousands of views on our each of our channels. So combined, like over 220,000 views. Um, right, right. Yeah. So that was basically it. I mean, and I'm very lucky, relatively speaking. I mean, no, I'm very lucky in absolute terms also. Like I'm, uh, I have my own shows. I have the Katie Helper show. I have Useful Idiots. This was not my only income. Although, of course, getting paid to host was very, was nice. Uh, and uh, you can, of course, join my Patreon at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper show. And, and definitely please do subscribe to youtube.com slash the Katie Helper show. That's obviously free to do to subscribe just because I am cut off from this. That's the most frustrating part is that I'm cut off from this very big audience that the Hill has. Um, which is a very frustrating feeling. And um, obviously I didn't get, to, I would have loved to have been able to be like, bye guys, you can follow me at my own channel, but they weren't going to do that. Um, and I guess that's it. I mean, th this is of course part of a lar larger story of people getting canceled and censored over Israel. I mean, Stephen Salida, who is a professor, got fired over tweets about Gaza uh, from his own personal account and he's now driving a bus to support himself. Um, obviously Norman Finkelstein's a famous case. Uh, Juan Cole, Mark Lamont Hill was fired by CNN for his comments that he made at the UN. Um, the, a woman at the AP over tweets that she had, uh, a woman at the AP uh, was fired over comments that she made at, on Twitter. Yeah. And um, of course, there are people who literally, uh, Emily Wilder is her name. And then, of course, there are people who literally uh, lose their, not just livelihoods, but their lives. I mean, what yeah. I did was I ranted and wrote a thing behind a camera miles and miles and miles and miles away from the occupation. But obviously, people like Shireen Abu Akhle, Sh Shireen Abu Akhle is just one of the most uh, notorious cases of Israel murdering a journalist. She was this uh, American Palestinian reporter uh, who was just killed by Israeli forces. They, of course, lied about it. They pretended it was like some Palestinian shooter. They found footage of a Palestinian shooting in some al some alley. Actually, Beth Selim was kind of crucial in debunking that. They just showed how, like, physically it would have been impossible for the bullet, a bullet shot in that alleyway to have reached Shireen Abu Akleh. So Israel not only killed her, but then they pretend tried to blame it on Palestinians. Right. Um, and Israel is kind of notorious for uh, shooting at people. We saw this during the March of Return, for instance, a lot. Uh, and uh, people were just shot at, even though they were wearing press jackets. And yeah, vests, I mean, and vests. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's it's so wild what took place. And I think one of the reasons it was really shocking was because the Hill has this whole oh, we are against censorship, we're against cancel culture, and specifically rising as a show, which is right. what you were hosting for. The whole idea is like the right wing and the left wing populist come together and debate issues and we don't censor no matter right. how extreme the views are. And you actually had been on the Hill in the past to talk about the right, Israel Right, that's an important stuff. part of the story. Yeah, right. So an important part of the story is that some people are like, oh, Katie, what were you thinking? Duh, you were going to get fired by them. They're corporate media. It's like, yes, but... Their shtick is that they let people say things that most that other corporate media won't let people say. And I had talked about Israel in my segments. I said right. that Israel killed Shirun Abu Akleh. I said that they lied about it. 
I covered Israel bombing a cemetery where children were visiting their grandfather's grave. I covered Israel shuttering human rights organizations. I mean, all, over the course of three years, I talked to Israel a lot. There was no indication that this would get me in trouble. I thought that people outside of the Hill would complain because that always happens when you cover Israel-Palestine. You're called right. an anti-Semite or a self-loathing Jew if you're lucky. Um, but I didn't think I was being like, uh, I wasn't do, I wasn't trying to make a statement. I wasn't being like, I'm going to do this. They're going to fire me and then I'm going to publicize it. I right. genuinely thought that this was a place uh, that I could say this stuff. Because again, they pride their sel themselves on being a place that unlike other corporate media outlets, lets their hosts and their guests say things that are outside of the, con the na very narrow confines of acceptable speech. Um and what we know now is that that's just a, mo a model to make money. There's no actual commitment to free speech or an actual commitment to uh, media that uh, that exists outside of the narrow uh, limits of what's acceptable speech. And again, this isn't like I was trying to, I wasn't engaging in hate speech. I literally was citing and summarizing international law, Israeli right. politicians, human rights organizations, including an Israeli one, Palestinian human rights organizations, uh, there is nothing fringe about it. The only, it just speaks to the fact, it speaks to how biased the media is that something like this would stand out. It doesn't stand out in the human rights community because again, it's just consensus. It's, it's accepted. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, also what, what is interesting of course is we don't know for sure why this decision was made. All we could do is speculate because no, none of us were in any particular room, but of course, you know, Branko, whose last name I always March to teach March to teach March to teach. Yeah. Uh, wrote for, wrote an article, a really good article at Jacobin. And he actually like dug a little deeper right? and he noticed that, and I'm just going to read from what he wrote. Um, he, he said, yes, it's hard to know what's driving this, but one thing that has changed since crystal ball and Sagar and Jetty's sit on the show is a changeover in ownership of the Hill, which was sold to media conglomerate next star media group Inc for $130 million last August. Um, and he also adds that this month, some, I can't pronounce it, but some company and uh, some investment firm Sago, based in Tel Aviv. Sago, 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 okay. Sago, so you pronounce yeah. the P and the yeah. S. Sago Value Holdings. I don't Hebrew, but I'm pretty sure that's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, this investment firm based in Tel Aviv bought 6,100 shares in Nexstar to the tune of more than $1 million. So that's one thing. Uh, there's, there's another thing too that he noticed, which is Nexstar in late August of this year, filled the position of deputy managing editor of News Nation, its cable channel, with someone called Jake Novak, who is a journalist, and I put journalist in big quotes there, who spent the preceding year and a half as the media director of the Israeli Consulate General in New York. Novak most recently achieved infamy for being embroiled in the Matt Gates underage sex controversy, where he appeared to admit to Dilbert cartoonist Scott Adams, of all people, that he was involved in the extortion attempt on Gates's rich father in order to funnel millions of dollars to a commando team leader to free a U.S. hostage in Iran. Like, that's why I put that journalist right. uh, in description in quotes. And it goes on that Novak has written approvingly of Donald Trump's dropping of U.S. support for the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And he's advocated for Israel to build more illegal settlements on the land that would make up a hypothetical Palestinian state, saying it would bring more peace, prosperity, and freedom to both Israelis and Arabs. Six days before the announcement of his hiring, Novak led a presentation at Bar Ilan University titled, quote, Defending Israel Against Media Bias, How to Fight News Media and Social Media Bias Against Israel. The best defense is a good offense. Right. It was an update of a talk he had given in 2016 about defending Israel's reputation which the host described as, quote, an absolute masterclass in public relations and diplomacy. So, I mean, the whole point here is that there's a couple there's a couple different areas where pressure could have been coming. It may have been from both of those places. It may have been from just one. It may have been from neither. And maybe it was the people there deciding themselves to sort of like operate in a self-censorship sort of capacity, right. which also happens. Yeah. But this is really alarming. Yeah. And there is, there's this organization that if someone really needs to do a deep dive into this, they're called Honest Reporting. They're ironically named, I think. They go after anyone who criticizes, I mean, their whole existence is to go after people and try to get them fired if they criticize right. Israel. They had written a piece about me called What the Hill, shows you how clever they are. 
uh, about one of my one of my segments. So maybe the hill is like it's pretty pathetic. But they're cowards that can't withstand like emails coming in. Uh, that could also be part of it. And I also want to just give people a sense that you know Novak uh, he actually wrote an op ed. Speaking of op eds about Israel, called "Why Trump Is Right to Back Away from the Two State Solution." Uh, and All he right. has, uh, argued that, uh, uh, he's defended Israel's illegal settlement saying it would quote, bring more peace, prosperity, and freedom to both Israelis and Arabs. <laughs> kind of, uh, hard to understand how that happens, but according to Jake, it does. And I wanted to ask you because one, there's a few things that happened in the aftermath of this. And one of them was that. Brianna Joy Gray, who is still a host at at Rising and in, in, in the same capacity that you were, um, actually well, did this she, like just to clarify, she's like reg a regular host. I was doing guest hosting, but yeah, you were she, kind of like, but you were kind of on your way to do. Yeah. I think you were on the path of, of regular right. hosting of becoming a regular host. So yeah, but she she does do it much more regularly. I think it's like on a weekly she's, basis uh, for her. Tuesdays through Thursdays. Yeah. Tuesday okay. Oh, Thursday. that's actually yeah. that's a lot of work. So. She um, actually did this monologue in one of their segments. I'm not going to play it here. I think people probably saw it and it was talked about quite a bit. Um, and in her monologue, she, just to paraphrase her, I mean, she noted it was wrong what happened to you. She disagreed with it. Um, and that she had this conversation with the higher ups at the Hill, who, of course, are still, you know, we're still claiming that, oh, it wasn't about, you know, the Israel thing, even though the guy told you it was. Um, yeah. but that it was a stylistic issue. <laughs> like yeah, after three right. years of working with you, they suddenly decided they didn't like your style. Yeah. My hair, um, my hair was bad. Yeah. Your hair was bad. It was fine before, but, right. um, but anyways, and that she was going to hold them to it and she decided to stay there and that she was going to do segments or do, do radars on Israel, Palestine when, when she saw, when she saw fit to, um, and I guess I'm just curious first, like, what was your reaction to that? Right. I mean, I, I was I was glad that she called them out on it. Um, I, I, I part of me is like, well, they probably will let you do Israel Israel segments because now that you I've been, you know, I ex exposed them or revealed what they did. They probably don't want that officially out there. So they probably yeah. will let Bree do them. She did do a segment on um, Bill Maher and uh, Netanyahu. But, you know. I was talking about it with a friend and my friend was like, yeah, but it's, it's kind of like when Mark Lamont Hill got fired, no one, everyone knows that he got fired over Israel. They let Peter Beinart come on and mm -hmm. make comments. So, you know, they're different. They're different. It's a question of kind of of degree. Also, I think that there's something to like the fact that, and Brianna said that she was like, you know, when she was talking to, to the higher ups there, they were like, you would have done it differently. She's like, yeah, mine wouldn't have been as good uh, <laughs> right. because Katie really focuses on this stuff. And there is, I think that it's a lot more threatening to hear a Jew. So I'm Jewish, by the way, uh, to no. hear someone, I know, to hear <laughs> someone Jewish make this argument. I mean, right. you can, again, we are dismissed as self-loathing Jews, but that's kind of like one degree more of protection not mm -hmm. really. Obviously, I can get you fired and stuff. And um, uh, but that gives you, you know, there are people you'll be able to. There are people who have their guards up for anti-Semitism. Who, if a Jew says that it's apartheid, will take that seriously. Not everyone. Mm -hmm. Some people are lost causes. And I know I'll probably get some pushback for this because people will say it's problematic. Yes, it's problematic. But we also live in the real world. Like for better or for worse, there are going to be people who are afraid that someone saying this is is anti-Semitic. And if it's someone Jewish says that they won't be as afraid that they're anti-Semitic. Right. Uh, it's a more, I mean, you know, so there's that also. So it's like not as like in a way it's like in their minds, maybe it's not as powerful when right. Mariana says it versus yeah. when you say it, because and it is also not an issue that she really has ever focused on, which is right. fine. She yeah. focuses on she's, a lot of other so, issues. I mean, she's, she's a former lawyer. So she has spoken about BDS and free speech. Um, and she certainly doesn't shy away from it, but it's not in her wheelhouse. Right, so, I right. mean, I'm, I think it's good that she did a segment on it. It didn't, it, it it talked about apartheid, but it didn't make the full, you know, my monologue, and she would be the first to admit this, my monologue, like, the entire point was laying out exactly why Israel's government and society and the way that they rule falls under the definition of apartheid. Her, I like, kind of, I think, quoted some people saying that, but it was more about um, Netanyahu and uh, Mar. 
Yeah, and I want to actually get to some of what they talked about and how that that has that has a whole nother sort of theme in it of weaponizing anti-Semitism. But before we right. get to that, I kind of want to like, I just want to also know like what what so Brianna did do that segment. And and what was interesting to me, the segment did well, but it just kind of also showed that had they just let your segment air, it would have just done well. It wouldn't have gotten the like hundreds of thousands of views that it views that between all of social media and like YouTube on our page and your page that it ended up getting in all of the like uh, buzz that it got right. and all of the articles that came along with that. Like they actually did themselves a huge disservice, but it also speaks to, and by the way, I'll link to, to that video uh, in the description of this episode, but I think it also speaks to the importance of independent media um, because it is, while it is useful, totally useful to be able to use certain corporate media outlets that have huge platforms and a lot more resources than we do, when they allow us to use them. Um, it also speaks to the fact that at the end of the day, the only place where you can really like make stuff happen is independent media. Right. And so I think that that's also a different. Another aspect of this is like, you were in a really interesting situation because you were still trying to negotiate with them. Um, and when you're in a situation like that, it's really easy on the outside to just be like, screw these people, expose right. them. But it's not that easy when you have something really big, like a corporate media outlet versus you. Right. This like one person who doesn't have the same resources right. and platform. Yeah. So like how like there must have been some kind of internal tug of war here, because in a way, the easier thing to do would have just been to suck it up. Right. And, you know, there's considerations there. Like you still get to do, you still get to host, you still get to do radars. You just don't touch this one issue. Right. So what yeah. was your thinking? I mean, there, it was like, I'm sure there's some people listening who are like, you should have just quit the second that they said that you couldn't do radars on it, but you could do segments on it. But my calculation was, it's not just, oh, I want to access this big audience for myself. It's like, I believe in these causes. They don't get coverage in, in corporate media. So if I have to stay and it's a terrible thing that they would have this double standard, but if I can stay and get out, like if I could argue that Israel is an apartheid state and argue that Rashida Tlaib was smeared yeah. uh, through my segments, then that's better than me not being there at all. So right. that was kind of my internal, uh, what I was grappling with. I mean, it wasn't just that I think that I do important segments on other issues. I mean, I talk about Ukraine a lot in a way that most corporate media does not. But I mean, it was really I was thinking about the pal the issue of Palestine and how if I uh, I again, it was like a, a calculation uh, where it's I thought it would be better, honestly, to have me there talking about Palestine, even if it wasn't in an op ed form. And I what I would have done was if they had said that I would have stayed, I would have done segments on it and I would have released the op ed with you guys. Right. But that's it. I just released the op-ed with you guys and won't be doing segments there, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But it also is interesting to me that I feel like there's like a, an opposite issue at other places. Like with The Hill, it's like you can talk about everything else. You can talk about Ukraine. You can talk about Syria. These are like in ways right. that you can criticize NATO. Like right. there's a line that you're allowed to take on so many issues that are just so taboo in the mainstream Whereas in the mainstream, while people do still get like fired over Palestine, there's more space, it feels like, to say that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, there's still it's still a horribly covered issue that's extremely biased. Right. But you'll see people like Nora Erekat getting to write op eds for The New York Times. Yeah. Like and, and The Washington CNN. Post. Right. Talking about BDS and talking about and, and on CNN. Right. Talking about like uh, the fact that Israel is an apartheid state and talking about the reality on the ground. So the the sort of like narrow confines now that exist at the Hill specifically over this issue, it's like the opposite is happening at other outlets. I don't know. It's just a weird observation. Right. I, I know what you mean. Like, is, yeah, Israel, Palestine, like there are other things that have replaced Israel, Palestine as like the third rail. It's still the third rail in some things, but like you and I know that there are lots of people who probably agree with us on Israel, Palestine, who disagree with us on Syria and Ukraine. Right. And I imagine like if like Ilhan Omar and we have sitting members of Congress who support BDS and they are attacked over it every so right. often, but it hasn't impacted their ability to be in Congress, at least not so far. Whereas if any of those members of Congress, I mean, you know, we're, we're recording this just a day after the progressive, the Congressional Progressive Caucus withdrew this letter that was super like reasonable and actually still so even tame. a little hawkish. Yeah. yeah, super tame. That was simply just asking President Biden 
to please pursue or prioritize diplomacy and negotiations because of the stakes of potential nuclear war in Ukraine. And within a day, they were they were so harshly pressured, the people who signed it, that they took it back. And then you just see tweets left and right from people being like, And they like, blamed oh, on their staffers. Yeah, which is such a cop out. Like you're telling me that you're on the most sensitive topic yeah, exactly. ever. Whoops. Your staffers, your staffers Whoops. forgot to vet, like all of yeah, your staffers. So ridiculous. Like all of the line of staffers on at everybody's offices that goes into it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that at this moment in time, it is actually more politically detrimental to one's career to speak out against NATO provocations or to simply just call for freaking diplomacy. I know, it's so ridiculous. And you over Ukraine than to call Israel an apartheid state. Of course, that is very specific to like what district you're in and things like this. But that's why it's even more bizarre that at the Hill, there's suddenly this weird third rail that right. doesn't even apply to other aspects of the mainstream. It's right. so confusing. Yeah, I mean, there are still people who are very, you know, they have they're committed to defending Israel's government at all costs. They can't admit that Israel does anything wrong. And the way that they want to get people delegitimize people who are critical of Israel is that they call them anti-Semites. I mean, there are different smears. Like you can be called an Assadist, as you know full well. You can be called a Putinist. You can be called a Republican. Like we saw that with it was pathetic. The Democrats did that. They basically said like uh, they didn't want to be misconstrued as agreeing with the Republicans who are because the Republicans are smart enough to know that they should at least pay lip service to uh, ha to maybe uh, understanding that people during recession don't want to give Ukraine a free check. I think that's. Um, that's what McCarthy said. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess, but the anti-Semitism thing is still the strongest. Right, that's true. So the other thing that I wanted to ask you about before I move on to a bit of a different topic here is I'm curious, like how many messages of solidarity you received from Bari Weiss and None. Bill Maher, None. who are adamantly opposed to cancel, cancel culture. culture right, yeah. And censorship. I'm just, can you, you want to read us some of those? I'm sure uh, like, yeah. you've they're been too inundated. Long. They're too long for me to read. No, I didn't get any of those, obviously. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Not at all surprising, though, because of the double standards that come from those people. And of course, this is my way to segue into the issue of Bill Maher. So obviously, another issue in the news right now that's tangentially, or not even really related to this, but we're talking about anti-Semitism, is Kanye West's like anti-Semitic mental breakdown yeah uh in public on twitter uh on various news interviews um and i want to you know and i just you know just to remind people this started i think it was like last week i mean the thing about kanye west that gets me is this guy's been saying bizarre crazy far-right shit for excuse my language i don't usually curse on this show i take that back but has been saying bizarre far-right things ranya Kalik takes back her condemnation I take of, my... of no! kanye <laughs> No. So he he's been saying crazy stuff like throughout Trump's presidency. He at one point he said slavery was a choice uh, by bl of black people. And then he also, I think, it like tried to uh, did he was he like a Harriet Tubman truther? He was like Harriet Tubman didn't really save anyone. Oh, I didn't know um, this. That yeah. Like some crazy just. But obviously he was like supporting Donald Trump was like at one point wore a White Lives Matter shirt. And this was all crazy, but of course, no matter how awful that was, none of it was crazy enough to get him fired, which I'm like, those are signs that this person has horrible, bigoted politics right? and were major red flags. But of course, in the U.S., we take anti-Semitism more ser seriously than anti-Black racism. That's just the way it is. Um, both of those things are very serious, obviously, right. but the anti-Black stuff should be taken just as seriously. But anyways, he, Kanye West... Of course, it was in the news again because Tucker Carlson had him on for like a really long, bizarre interview that I did not watch. And then afterwards, Kanye West tweeted like one day when he woke up that he was going to go Death Con 3 on Jewish people. Yeah. Um, I think he meant Death Con, but it was considered to be a typo um, or a misspelling of sorts. Uh, and then he went on to like defend himself by insisting that black people are actually Jewish. Well, he said black people are Jew, actually Jew also. So not the best grammar there. Um, and then he accused maybe Jewish he meant people, you. Yeah, maybe. And then he accused Jewish people of blackballing anyone who opposes your agenda. And you guys have toyed with me. So just like really bizarre, 
I think this guy, we know, I think he's bipolar. Must have, yeah. You know, having some manic episode mixed in with his crazy bigoted views. And that's what that looked like. Twitter took it down. And that was like controversial. He lost, I think, some support or at like, yeah, you know, some uh, deals. and then he was on Piers Morgan and the, the interview with Piers Morgan is like an hour and 40 minutes long. So I, I didn't watch it. So, and I was trying to find a clip of the craziest thing he said, but I could only find on TikTok. And I actually like, just because it's so insane, I want to play this one sure. little very short clip. Um, I just like, don't even know why, but here we go. Here's Connie. <laughs> I mean, here we go. I'm just gonna play it. Okay, so I'll say this. Would it be, would, would I have grown into the box you want me to go in if I say, to specify the business people that have raped my people that just so happen to be Jewish? I think what by doing what you've just done, I find that I'm not even Jewish and I find that offensive. What Why do you keep having to do the that? the hell? I don't think I you know. get it at all. I don't I think know. you, know. I don't think you understand what he's supposing when he keep... you keep... Okay, so... so so he like, that's like one of many, like, I don't know if you saw that, Katie. Did you see that? I was like shocked yeah. when I watched that. Um, and there was like other moments, but for some reason, like nobody was posting them on Twitter. I think because it was such a long interview, you had to like really watch right. it to find like the little nuggets like that. So eventually because of clips like that, then Adidas eventually like pulled right. out of their yeah. sponsorship with him or his company or whatever it is they have. But the reason I raise this is because as all this was happening, Bill Maher, by the way, I like himself. the fact that like Pierce Morgan's like, I'm not even Jewish and I'm offended. Like you don't have to be a member of a group to be offended. Like I'm not black and I'm offended by white lives matter. Yeah. He also, I think on Twitter was like basically that the Jews control Hollywood and that that's why he got canceled because they're the ones right. in control. Like just all these really anti-Semitic, horrible anti-Semitic stereotypes. Um, Which he's I have lost to say fire. I mean, this is fire. That's one of the reasons I'm so upset when people get fired over Israel stuff. I'm like, do you really want to lean into that stereotype? Like, right now, to be right. fair, most Christian, most Zionists are Christian, so that's good, a good thing to remember when people and mo and so and it's really something we didn't talk about is the fact that the very conf the very notion that being uh, critical of Israel or um, not being a Zionist or being anti-Zionist, the very notion that that's anti-Semitic is an anti-Semitic trope. Because it plays into the dual loyalty idea that Jews are just inherently, first of all, that we're a monolith and that mm -hmm. we're all supportive of the Israeli government. And again, it's interesting because like anti-Semites conflate Zionism with being Jew. They call it being Jewish. They call Jews Zionists. They use those terms in interchangeably. And so APAC and the ADL are trafficking in the same trope that uh, anti-Semites traffic in. Oh, absolutely. And then you'll get these like, and then, I mean, think about how that plays out in the Middle East. You have a country that literally has a Star of David on its flag, claims to be like doing all of these aggressive military maneuvers against Lebanon and Palestine and Syria in the name of the Jewish people. Right. And then we'll be like, oh my God, everyone in Lebanon and Syria and Palestine is just so anti-Semitic right. because they think that Jews are too powerful. And it's like, that is very, like, I even remember the ADL, I think I mentioned this to you before, the ADL did this survey one year in the West bank where they like on yeah. to see how anti-Semitic Palestinians were. And like one of the questions on the survey was like, do you think Jews have too much power? Right. And it's like, okay, if you're asking Americans that and they say yes, and yes, yeah. that's anti-Semitic. Right. You're asking Palestinians in an apartheid state where Jews literally being Jewish gives you right. more power by right. law. Right. How on earth can you right. accuse yeah, them of anti-Semitism? Yeah. It's completely absurd. And of course, yes, it does like a huge disservice to Jews. And it is, a testament to the danger Israel actually does pose to Jews when whenever there's a huge Israeli military campaign, you actually see incidents of anti-Semitism around the world go up. Um, I mean, that's like a, that's something that needs to be like interrogated. Yeah. But of course, Israel would like probably call that, you know, and even talk yeah, that discussion. Right, as saying that, right. Yeah. And I mean, right. they cozy up to anti-Semites in, in like mm -hmm. Orban in Hungary, the Polish government. I mean, that's also another thing. Like yeah. this isn't. Israel doesn't care about Jews. They care or, about Zionism. They care exactly. about a particular political project. And Zionism is a is Israeli a political government, project. I should say. Right. Zionism is a political project that is European. We should add it was like a yeah. European political project that was a, you know, consequence of its time. It was part of other, you know, ethno, ethnic and religious based nationalistic movements that existed at the time. It was a European settler colonial project that happens to still continue on today in the yeah. 21st century. But you know, that's a that's a convert that's an that's an important conversation to have. But what I wanted to note is that 
you know, I'm not going to play a clip of it because I worry about uh, copyright violation uh, with Bill Maher and HBO, but Bill Maher on his show, the real time with Bill Maher about this Kanye West controversy invites Benjamin Netanyahu on of all people, one of the most horrible people in the world, by the way, just like a right wing jerk. Who's probably going to be prime minister of Israel again. And who's very also corrupt. very literally facing corruption charges for the last several years. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu on to talk, to ask him about Kanye West, but doesn't actually ask him about Kanye West. He uses Kanye West yeah. to segue into right. anti-Israel tweets by uh, squad members of Congress. Yeah. So yeah, he, he uses quotes, uh, uh, Ilhan, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. He doesn't name them. I wonder if he does name them because he knows how much hate and like like death threats they would get. Maybe. I don't think he'd care about that so much. Yeah. I think he, 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 he would call that free speech. Don't cancel the death threats. Don't be right. a cancel yeah, warrior. Right. Cancel culture yeah. warrior. Um, but he did. And in this, in this, this is, this is a perfect example of weaponizing anti-Semitism. Yeah. Like an anti-Semitic incident by a celebrity actually took place. And you use that as an opportunity to connect it to criticism of Israel, which as far as I know, Kanye West said nothing about Israel. Yeah. It's well, it's um, both sizing anti-Semitism. Ali Abu Nima talks about this, right? It's it's saying like, well, on the right, we have people who say the Jews uh, run Hollywood, have too much power. Uh, or we also have people who shoot up synagogues. But then on the left, we have people who support BDS. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Yeah, Those are the same exact thing. Yeah. thing. People yeah. who support BDS. But in that sense, like what, how do you deal? It's easier for you in a sense, not necessarily because you still got fired. But in a way, it is easier for you as a Jew to maybe deal with the weaponized anti-Semitism because in that case, you're part of this minority group that's that, you know, there's claims of bigotry being made. And so if you're questioning it, then right. it comes off as a more powerful thing than if others are. But I think one of the hardest aspects for a lot of people of delving into this issue is they're scared of being called anti-Semites. Yeah. So I guess what's your advice to I mean, the, to dealing with that accusation when it comes to the issue of Palestine, which is I'm, I'm talking about the weaponization of it. Right. I mean, there are a couple of things that you can do. One is and I'm probably going to get pushback from this, but you can point out, you know, and I'll get pushback for this because Palestinian voices are just as legitimate uh, as Jewish voices. And of course, Palestinians know more than anyone else. And they've been making the claim that it's apartheid for way longer than, you know, the human rights. They were ahead of the human rights uh like organization consensus on it being apartheid. But I do think it's useful like to point out that, you know, look, the people if you you think like anti okay, so Amnesty International is anti-Semitic. All right. And what is Betselem then? Like a cabal of self-loathing Jews? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And you can point to the fact that like, I mean, you can say it's not being anti-Zionist is not anti-Semitic. And in fact, it's anti-Semitic to conflate being Jewish with being Zionist. And you can say that there are Jews who adamantly speak out against Israel, who say APAC doesn't represent them, who say the ADL doesn't represent them. There's Jewish Voice for Peace. There's, if not when, now, if not now, when, uh, you know, that there's a whole movement. There's a whole, uh, that, that APAC and ADL, the ADL are very powerful and high profile, but they don't represent most Jews. Right. And that's that's very correct. And in fact, a lot of their increasingly a lot of their base is just like basically various in the case of ADL, like various like social media companies that advises yeah. on what to like shut down. Um, and then in the case of APAC, increasingly Christian Zionists. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, Christians want Jews to go back. These are the, they're such good allies that they want uh, Christian Zionists are such good allies. They want Jews to go back to Israel. So we will bring on the rapture. Mm -hmm. And I think 400 of us can survive, but the rest of us will burn in internal damnation. Oh, only I didn't even know that there was a 400 people yeah. get to serve. Like, that's a really what does that number symbolize? 400? No idea. OK, yeah. Well, maybe you'll be one of the 400. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll make Aliyah, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's un but it's, it's really it really is like incredible how much magical thinking like is being relied on to sustain a settler colonial state in the name of Jewish people. And it's like all these crazy, sorry to be so sorry. I, I'm sorry if I'm offending the Christian Zionists in the audience, yeah. but it's all these, like, not crazy all Christian Christians. Zionists, just kidding. Yes. All Gosh, of them. Yeah. yeah all yeah. of you. All of also, also then you have religious Jews. This is interesting. I mean, I don't see eye to eye with them, but you do have religious Jews who are anti-Zionist because they need to be told by God or something before yeah. They like, take, they go back to, before yeah. they go back to like Jerusalem, they need yeah. God to tell them. It's very, you know, again, more magical thinking, but yeah, there are people 
on all sides of this. And there is like an inter-Jewish conflict over this issue. And it kind of always has been, actually. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a real history of anti-Zionism among Jews. Again, there was a division. I mean, there, the, there were a lot of people who thought that Zionism was a bad idea, that it would lead to more anti-Semitism. There are Holocaust survivors who are uh, anti-Zionist, which is fascinating because Israel derives so much of it uh, or tries to derive so much of its legitimacy by weaponizing the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, Lots and, you know, I also want to say it's not like there were I understand why people wanted to find a Jewish home. I don't I, it's not d defensible or justifiable the way it was done. But I get I get why people did. You know, there were programs and there were then there was the Holocaust. So but that doesn't mean that it was right. Yeah. Or other people should be displaced in order right. for this to exist. And also, like, what does this home look like? Is it just this crazy, aggressive, like, right. Sparta state. Yeah, ethnic yeah. cleansing. And also, you know, they were, this was also something that was, that Europe used. Uh, they wanted to have like a, you know, a civilized foothold in the region. They saw this as their opportunity to have, you know, they, by aiding the creation of the state, uh, they saw that they would have some control or foothold there. So that's another thing. It's kind of this, I mean, you know, you, it's just disgusting to see Palestinians pay the price for the crimes uh, of Germans or Europeans, yeah. the yeah. crimes of Europeans, as I tell Ali always puts it at one time, yeah. Ali Abunimo was on like a German media outlet and he was like, why do Palestinians have to continue to pay the price for your crimes? That's really funny. And he's right. He's yeah. absolutely right. Um, no, I mean, there's and there's so many like good, there's so many excellent books about all of that. I feel like we need to make like there probably yeah. is some sort of reading list. Yeah, we but should. I, like in the after, so in the aftermath of all this, like one thing that's been really cool is you have been kind of on like a crusade. Yeah, no pun intended. Yeah, right, a Jewish um, crusade. A, a Jewish, Jewish crusade. A Jewish crusade. You heard it here, folks. Yeah. Uh, to cover this issue, you've had on a lot of really great people. Um, and yeah. if anyone's got, in the Washington, D.C. area, I'm going to be doing an event with Miko Pellet, uh, who's a great, great person. He wrote uh, a book called The General's Son and Israeli's Journey in Palestine. He's the son of a decorated J Israeli general on his uh, mother's side. His grandfather was one of the signatories to Israeli independence, and he went from being a proud Zionist to a liberal Zionist to just a one state solution supporting anti-Zionists. Pro resistant, book. even like a pro, he's like very pro resistance, pro yeah, across yeah, the region, yeah. very anti imperialist, and yeah, like really from one side to the to completely the other, yeah. uh, which shows that people can evolve and change, right. uh, on these issues. But, um, what has been like the sort of, I guess, response? Like, have you had an I obviously Barry Weiss didn't call you up, but right. like, have you had an outpouring of support? Yeah, there were a lot of people who covered it. Um, Mondo Weiss, I did a podcast with Electronic Intifada. Will Meneker at Chapo had me on. Uh, Juan Cole covered it. Um, uh, Sheer Post uh, covered it. Common Dreams. Um, I'm probably leaving people out. You, you, but... wrote, a, you wrote a piece. For oh, the I wrote an op-ed for the Daily Beast. Right. Uh, the Real News had me on. Richard Esco had me on. Um, uh, so really, I'm like AJ late to Plus the game. did a video. Um, I uh, Middle East Eye is doing a video. They interviewed me. I'm not sure when oh. that's coming out. I'm supposed okay. to do something with IMEU. I got to meet Rashida Slave because I was invited to a fundraiser uh, yeah. for her. Yeah. yeah. How is she? Like, what's she like? Is she really nice and really funny? Really, yeah? really, really, really funny. Yeah. When she's not calling out Israeli apartheid, she's just making jokes. Yeah, really great, <laughs> great storyteller. That's awesome. So no, that's really that's all really good to hear. And also, you know, I feel like it's a good moment to remind people that this is why you have to support independent media. Obviously, Katie, you're not at the hill anymore. So where can people continue to support your work? Yeah, youtube.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Please subscribe. Please like the videos. Um, Patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Uh, I had Nora Ericot on, Miko Pellet. I have Patreon-only interviews with Roger Waters, um, Kit Clarenberg, who talks about the British intelligence uh, plot to blow up the bridge to Crimea. Um, I had on, uh, yeah, lots of lots of great people, uh, and I'm going to have on Michael Hudson. Nice. Uh, I I guess I'll say I'm going to have on Jeffrey Sachs. We haven't Ooh, nailed down the date yet. That's yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah, really exciting. Very exciting. That, yeah. He's been all over the place, yeah. sounding like he's been reading the stuff that we read lately. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching Richard that. Wolf I also I had Richard Wolf on. I had Norman Finkelstein on. I have him on regular, then I have him on Patreon. Yeah. 
And you also, I just wanted to throw out that you also are an excellent stand-up comedian, which I got to see oh, in yeah, person thank you. Thanks. for the first time. I was like super, not that I thought you were going to be bad. No, I know what you like, mean. It's like you don't was, want, it's it's anxiety provoking because you, you want, you are nervous that what if your friend's not funny? What do you say after? Like, great well, job. I knew you were, you were going to, actually, that, that didn't cross my mind. Oh. I knew you were going to be funny. I just, it was like, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And it was really good. And now, obviously, you've committed a crime. So the police are after you because I hear them in the background. Oh, yeah. Right. It's for my, uh, <laughs> my juice aid. Yeah. <laughs> They're coming for you. Well, in that case, Katie, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Of thank course. you for, for your... making the video with me. Yeah, of course. And thank And I'll link to that again in the description. Thank you for all of your bravery and all of that of what you do. And hopefully we can have you back on in the future, not for being fired, right? but for something for being a little bit hired. Fun. Yeah. For being hired. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, Head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.